Mitch report. I'm Amy Goodman. We've all come to know the words extreme weather. Wildfires rage across California and a state of emergency is declared in several counties. Torrential rain in the Midwest and historic levels of flooding from Iowa to Missouri. At least six people are killed by tornadoes in Iowa and Kansas. A heat wave on the East Coast has claimed the lives of a number of people. In China, people have barely had time to recover from the recent earthquake. Flooding and rain have killed over 60 and left over a million people homeless. Meanwhile, record drought in many parts Parts of the United States and Australia continue. The words extreme weather are rarely associated in the mainstream media with another two words, global warming. But scientists argue these extreme weather events are consistent with changes they've long predicted would accompany global warming. We turn now to climate blogger and scientist Joseph Rahm. He's a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress, was acting assistant secretary of energy for energy efficiency and renewable energy during the Clinton administration. We're also joined on the phone from Des Moines by environmental journalist Perry Beeman. He's an award-winning investigative reporter for the Des Moines Register. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! I want to begin with the big picture. With the big picture. Joseph Rahm, uh, can you talk about what's happening around the world and how it is conveyed to us. Sure. Well, I think that to any objective observer, the weather has definitely gotten more extreme. We hear more about these record floods, uh, not just in Iowa, but in, in Great Britain and in China. We're seeing the, the spread of, of drought and deserts in, in places like Australia uh, and here, of course, in the United States. Uh, more intense rainfall, more extreme heat, uh, record wildfires, and in general, the media is is covering this as this is all sort of unconnected events. Uh, just regular weather maybe gone a little wacky, uh, but in fact, the scientific community has predicted for more than two decades now that uh, as we pour more heat trapping greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Uh, the planet would heat up, and that would redistribute water. Uh, if you heat up the planet, then places that are kind of arid will lose soil moisture and they'll become drier. Whereas you put, you heat up the planet, you evaporate more water, and areas that are wetter will tend to see more intense rainfall and deluges and earlier snow melts, and all that will lead to flooding. So what we're seeing is exactly what scientists have been telling us uh, would happen because of human emissions. Why do you think this lack of coverage, of making the connection? I mean, uh, the coverage of the extreme weather is pervasive. It is extensively covered on all of the networks. Well, there is a couple of reasons, one of which is, uh, and, and if you read uh, the work of Ross Gelbspan, a, a Pulitzer Prize winning uh, reporter from, from Boston, uh, he talks about how the, those who oppose action on global warming and those who are skeptical of global warming have worked very hard to uh, attack the media whenever they, they point out this connection. Um, I think, I, so I do think that that is part of the reason. I also think that part of the reason is that the people who write about global warming uh, for most newspapers uh, and, 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 and TV uh, are not the same people as those who tend to cover weather. Um, you know, the New York Times has a reporter who covers global warming, uh, and he's quite good. But he is not the guy who goes to Iowa to write about the flooding there. So I think this is a failure of the, the editors. Uh, at, at newspapers uh, who, whose job is to sort of assign reporters and, and look at the big picture. Uh, and I say this as someone, who, my father was a newspaper editor for 30 years, so that was his job, was to, to, to figure out the big picture and, and, and educate his readers. And what is the connection, for example, between the wildfires that have raged in places like Santa Cruz to Sacramento to the flooding we see in Iowa to what's happening now in China, the very place where the earthquake devastated Sichuan province now, the terrible rains and flooding? Well, I think uh, global warming puts more water vapor into the atmosphere. And so you are, what you, 
are expected to see is, is more rain, but not just any type of rain, but rain that comes in very intense downpours over one or two days, uh, you know, that we would call deluges. Um, so that is something we expect. Wildfires are quite interesting because they have multiple causes. Obviously, when it's dry and hasn't rained for a while and the soil is drier, you're going to see wildfires. But the other thing that has occurred across much of the country and Canada is that pests, particularly the so-called bark beetle, uh, used to be wiped out in the winter. The larvae used to be wiped out by very cold winters. But since winters aren't as cold anymore, the larvae survive. So we've had m these huge infestations of bark beetles that, for instance, have pretty much, uh, they're on, the, on uh, track to wipe out every harvestable, harvestable pine tree in, in British Columbia. And when you combine drier soil with more pests, and, and the trees, of course, need water to produce the sap to fight off the beetles. And then finally, the other piece you see is the earlier snow melt. A lot of the West doesn't get rainfall in the summer and early fall. In order to stay moist, what has happened traditionally is that the snow has melted slowly over the course of the summer, and the streams have provided water and humidity for the West. But now, because of global warming, the snow is melting earlier and earlier. So that gets you, A, the more intense streams uh, and flooding in the, in, the early, in the late spring and early summer, and then you just get very dry by the midsummer and late summer, and so you get more wildfires and although wildfires don't get a lot of attention <clears throat> in this country except when they <clears throat> hit Californian homes it might surprise people to know that since the year 2000 the United States has lost in wildfires an area of trees equal to the state of Idaho we have seen record-breaking uh, uh, wildfire season after record-breaking wildfire season we're talking to Joseph Rahm. He uh, runs the blog Climate Progress at climateprogress.org, Senior Fellow at the Center for American Progress. We're also joined by Perry Beeman, staff writer for the Des Moines Register. Are you dry right now, Perry? Uh, well, we're dry in uh, most parts of Des Moines. The uh, north, north of downtown in Des Moines, we have an area where we had a levee break that's People are just now being able to survey the damage, and it's still very wet up there. The eastern part of the state is still pretty much a disaster zone along several of the major rivers. First, can you sum up um, what the state of Iowa is, looks like right now, um, from Cedar Rapids to Iowa City to Des Moines? What are the reports coming in? Well, we have... Uh, we now still have 36,000 people who are out of their homes. They've been evacuated. Uh, Cedar Rapids, the water is, is falling, but we went from uh, 100 blocks covered to 400 blocks, and I think it was somewhere over 1,000 yesterday. A lot of the central, just a lot of the uh, very heavily developed neighborhoods in downtown Cedar Rapids are, are under. The river is falling there. Iowa City, the Iowa River crested yesterday, which is good news, but the University of Iowa is seeing flooding in places it never has on, on record. Uh, th this is a flood that's worse than 1993 in places in Iowa, and those are two places that it definitely is worse than 93. In Des Moines, the, uh, it was at least equal to 93, but there has been less damage because there, there were considerable improvements made after 93. Interestingly, though, the levee that broke the other day that flooded uh, a uh, you know, reasonably poor area and one of the ma major Des Moines high schools, uh, at least surrounded that high school with water, is, is a levee that was a known problem in 93. The Corps has a plan to fix it, but so far has, uh, Congress hasn't appropriated money to even design the levee. And so uh, it... Uh, was one of these that was improperly built. It got saturated and it failed. In '93, it was over top. So, uh, so in, in some cases, we haven't fixed problems we knew about. And in many cases, uh, in particular, in a, a suburban area of Des Moines that is prone to having, you know, six or seven feet of water in a major flood, 
there's not a drop of water in that that district this time around. You're the bad news. You're the former president of the Society of Professional Journalists. What right. about that? Journalists. Sorry. Society of Environmental. Of environmental journalists, I meant. Right. Um, what about that issue of connecting extreme weather, which is getting extensive coverage, to global warming? Well, interestingly enough, I, uh, in my reporting for the Des Moines Register, just not even a few weeks before this all happened, we were in the middle of doing a climate change series that's going to run over the year, and I had just examined that very issue. In fact, we had a, a double truck or two-page you know, spread graphic talking about the different things that would happen and pointing out